I like fast boats. Who doesn't like them? Maybe you don't like them. Let's find out if a planing boat is right for you. Zoom! No better way to describe planing boats. They pack very fast speeds into a very small package. Many planing boats achieve speeds well beyond the limits of larger craft. How do they do it? And what are the penalties for this extreme speed? Planing hulls act completely differently from other types of displacement hulls. Displacement hulls depend on the hydrostatic forces to stay afloat. They sit at the same draft regardless if they are at rest or at speed, ignoring some secondary effects. But planing hulls utilize a combination of hydrostatics and hydrodynamics. As their speed increases, they rise out of the water. Less hull in the water means less resistance. Great, allowing the planing boat to achieve even faster speeds. Designers regularly create planing hulls capable of 40 to 60 knots. A planing hull is a speed demon. What magic do these hulls employ to get out of the water? Myself, I bet on voodoo. No, not really. It comes down to two ingredients, hull shape and speed. A conventional displacement hull tries to minimize disturbance to the water. Good reason, pushing the water sideways creates resistance. But conversely though, planing hulls maximize water disturbance. They push the water down though, instead of sideways. When you push down, the water pushes back up on the boat hull. Shove around enough water and your boat rises out of the water. This trick doesn't work all the time though. That is why we need the second element, speed. At low speeds, pushing the water around just adds to your resistance. It's a drag. Only at high speeds, do we overcome the resistance and achieve planing? But this magic does have its limits, including size limitations. Beware death by cubes and squares. Sounds like some sort of weird omen, but no, it's science. Planing hulls will never scale to larger sizes without limit. They suffer from something called the cube square law. See, I want you to picture how the weight of that boat changes as we scale it up to larger sizes. Ignoring all the complexities, we can simplify this to assume that mass scales up by the cube of vessel size. Double the length of your hull and the weight increases eight times larger. We have to balance that weight increase with the planing surface of our hull. Ah, there's a problem. See, the hull and its planing force it's basically just dependent on surface area, which scales up by the square of the vessel size. Double the length of the ship, and the planing force only increases four times. Uh-oh, that creates a problem. Four is less than eight. We don't have enough planing force to support our weight. That is the curse of the cube square law. No matter what, at a certain size, the weight of your hull increases faster than the planing force can keep up. Practically speaking, most planing hulls top out in the size range of 20 to 24 meters. Many are quite a bit less. You will never scale planing hulls up to massive ship sizes. Provided you can accept these size limitations, planing hulls have a lot to offer. These boats scream fast. Imagine the fighter jets of the boat world. That's a planing boat. Fast, fast, fast. Lots of speed packed into a small package. That's good because small packages are very maneuverable. They have excellent stability and small packages have low costs. I think the real advantage of planing hulls is their economy. See, they deliver extreme speed in a very small and low cost package. No need for massive engines that are as large as houses or long hulls that are as long as a city block. Not necessary. With planing hulls, smaller yields faster. Performance comes with challenges. Due to the cube square law, 
Planing hulls tolerate very little weight. You want to minimize the weight as much as you can. These are not cargo haulers. Once you add in the engines, the fuel, the crew, these hulls can accommodate very little extra. And the introduction of planing created a new problem for our designer. Balancing the boat becomes a great deal more difficult. See, on a planing hull, the center of effort shifts further aft as the hull rises out of the water. This forces the designer to balance most of the boat weight near the transom. Weight distribution is paramount to the design. Just a few degrees of trim can alter the maximum speed of the boat. Planing hulls require constant vigilance in the design phase and active interest in maintaining the boat balance. One of the reasons for this vigilance is because those balance problems exacerbate when facing ocean waves. Running at 40 knots speed, those ocean waves transform from gentle rolling hills into deadly ramps ready to send you airborne. In a planing boat, wise operators are going to work hard to avoid storms. The main reason for this is we have a new threat from our ocean waves, extreme slamming. A wave rockets up and explodes against the side of your hull. Imagine a high speed car crash with the water and then keep doing that three to five times every minute. These extreme forces require extensive structural reinforcement in the hull, or they might quickly punch a hole through your hull. There's extensive operator fatigue when operating planing boats. The rapid changes in speed from slamming yield very high accelerations. Although they last for only a short duration, operators can experience the same levels of acceleration seen on fighter jets and rocket ships. Protecting the crew often requires special motion isolation chairs, which may cost thousands of dollars each. Most often, planing hulls are going to get limited by human endurance long before they hit any structural limits. Let's be honest, you still want to know where you can use this, right? Because fast boats are fun. Well, the obvious choice leads to mind. Recreational boats. As I said, they are fun. This allows great activities like sport fishing, water skiing, racing, but we also have professional applications where a boat travels fast. Here's a little fun fact. Much of the original research for the very high speed planing hulls actually focused on applications for seaplanes and their pontoons during takeoff and landing. There's a classic case of a commercial application. Seaplanes, patrol vessels, firefighting vessels, military vessels, drone ships, coast guard cutters. Despite their size limitations, planing hulls fill a large niche in the maritime industry. Power, speed, performance. These buzzwords fly around the concept of planing hulls. They promise incredible capabilities and adjust to a wide range of mission needs, unless the weather is bad. Sea keeping, slamming, and low deadweight capability frequently plague planing hulls with design challenges. They demand a higher precision in the design effort because simply increasing the size of the hull offers very few solutions. That's our cubed square law kicking in. But if you accept these limitations, the planing hull compacts large capabilities into a small economic package. Sometimes smaller is better. Thanks very much. I'm Nick, the Naval Architect. Active heave compensation. Stability tests done from start to finish. Four ways to break your structure. Statistics and sea keeping. These are just some of the videos that I have planned for the future. If you want to see more amazing videos about ships, then click that like button or subscribe if you're new to the channel. I'll see you next time for more awesome insights about boats.